Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the November 2023 meeting of the Montgomery County Civic Federation. My name is Alan Bowser. Thank you all for joining us on this very busy evening. We've got an exciting program this evening and hope you all enjoy it. We have some Federation business to take care of at the outset. Um, the first thing is to approve the agenda, which is on page two of the Civic Federation newsletter. And I get a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Uh, second. second. First and second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you. Agenda is approved. Next order of business is to approve the, the minutes of the October general meeting. They're on page 10 of the newsletter. If you all had a chance to read them, we put lots of care and time into them. Um, somebody want to make a motion to approve the meetings of the October 2023 general meeting? So moved. Second. It's oh, been first and hey, Chris Reynolds has been first and second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, the minutes are uh, the minutes are approved. Uh, normally, this is the time when we have the treasurer's report, but our treasurer Jerry Garson is at a meeting, I think sponsored by the State Highway Administration on improvements to the American Legion Bridge. He will join us later in our meeting for a treasurer's report. Uh, at this point, after the treasurer's report, we uh, ask for an announcement. If anybody has any announcements they'd like to make to the to the rest of the group about things going on in their neighborhood or things that are uh, coming up. Does anybody have any announcements they'd like to make? I'll make one. Uh, Saturday, the 18th, is the annual Montgomery County Thanksgiving Parade. Starts at uh, 10 o'clock, goes to 12. It's uh, televised. Starts at the Silver Spring Civic Building and uh, goes up Ellsworth Drive, a left on uh, George Avenue down to uh, Silver Spring Avenue, where it concludes. It's uh, the only uh, Thanksgiving parade in the DMV, well, at least close in jurisdictions. So there's a lot of bands and uh, participation from uh, high schools and uh, dancing groups. There's dogs, there's horses, there's floats. Uh, it's a fun time. Uh, the Civic Federation is going to uh, be represented in the parade. We have a car. Jerry Garson is going to drive it. If any of you would like to uh, parade with us, We'll be meeting at the corner of Ellsworth Drive and Veterans Place. It's behind the Civic Building at uh, 10 o'clock. And when Jerry's car comes out of the garage, uh, we'll get in and march behind him. And Tell me again, uh, where, where, where are you meeting again? Uh, at the intersection of Ellsworth Drive and Veterans Place. It's behind the Civic Building. It's where the entrance to the Ellsworth garage is. That's where the staging area is. It's a good time. It's a short parade route. It could be done by uh, done by noon. So we'd like to see anybody there who wants to join us. So that's my announcement. Uh, anybody else have any announcements? Not seeing any announcements. Welcome, Max. Good to see you there. I know you're doing the Lord's work with the People's Council. Interested to hear more about that later. Then without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to our first uh, vice president, Peggy Dennis, who is going to lead us in uh, tonight's program. Peggy. And I will be very short because I know Karen Madsen, who is our first presenter, is tired and she wants to get her bit done. Uh, Karen is one of the founders and very active with Conservation Montgomery, along with you, Alan. So Karen, take it away. Okay. All right, hey everybody. Um, I am really glad to see so many familiar faces uh, again with the Civic Fed. It's 
it's been a while since I've been in one of these meetings. Conservation Montgomery is, um, uh, what are we, an associate member, Alan? Uh, so we are a member of the Federation and happy to happy to be there. Let me explain one thing before I get started. I'm the chair of Conservation Montgomery. Um, the presentation is going to be fairly simple. It's going to be about what you can do, what we can all do to work together to um, protect or sustain our tree canopy in the county. I am not an arborist. I am not a licensed tree care expert. Uh, I hang out with a lot of those people and they impart their knowledge uh, willingly. And um, I have been involved in tree issues in the county for 20 years. So um, not an expert, but they say if you spend I think it's, who was it, Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote a book and said, if you spent 20,000 hours doing anything, it meant you're a master, but I don't feel like a master. Anyway, but it's been 20 years. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and just launch into the presentation for the night. Here's the title, how we can work together to sustain our tree cover. We can't see it yet. Oh, sorry. You know what? That's because I did not share my screen hang on and i'm gonna share my screen all right here we go all right can you see that yeah okay and i'm gonna switch it to slide view and i'll minimize things over there so all right going going back well just starting wait a minute let me all right here we go Going back to the first slide, this is just introducing the topic, how we can work together to sustain tree cover in the county. And as you guys know, this has been an issue for a long time. A lot of changes have taken place over the years. And I'm gonna talk about a little bit of that and what we can all do. Just a little bit about us, Conservation Montgomery. We're a 501c3, we were formed in 2010 as a nonprofit, and we decided to make our focal point um, trees. And it's because of the many, many environmental services that trees provide for us. Um, we are the only organization of our kind in the county that has trees as sort of ground zero or the, the central focus for what we do. Uh, we do partner with other organizations around the county to address common concerns. Um, we have an advocacy committee. They do uh, great work. They cover the issues around the county. We've got someone who is looking more at down county. We have folks up in uh, the Ag Reserve and um, monitoring 10 Mile Creek and that type of thing. So our two main components are advocacy and then public outreach and um, education. And I'm gonna talk about this program right here a little more later. This is Home Tree Care 101, which is one of our signature programs. And it is now included as part of the County Climate Action Plan. We're really proud to say that. All right, our mission just quickly is pretty simple to sustain our quality of life and natural resources. And uh, we do that through awareness and uh, decision-making on our part as individuals in the county, whoops, I keep doing that, I keep hitting that. And uh, also we hope to have some influence and that goes into the vision. We hope to have some influence on our elected officials and uh, citizenry in the county. And um, hope we you know, find some partnership and common ground with our elected officials. We are governed by a board of directors. There's a <clears throat> fellow there who probably looks familiar on the far right. And um, that's our, our board from um, our annual meeting. And um, so I'm just gonna go, this is me, of course, Jenny Barnes. Many of you know Jenny from over the years, John Parrish, who is a botanist and, and a really a wonderful person on our advocacy committee. We have Vanessa Pinto, uh, we have Lauren Brown, we have Cornelius Kutisa. Helen Wood is our treasurer, Amanda Farber, many of you know Amanda, and then Helen 
Burns. So um, that is our board. Not everybody. We we didn't have everybody in that picture. Beth Daly's on the board and a few others. Okay, so this is getting to the root, no pun intended, of why we decided to focus on trees. And uh, I don't know why my dog's barking. I'm close the door here. Um, our focus uh, on trees. This is a graphic um, that I put together. It's just called the talking tree. And basically it's just, uh, if a tree could talk, this is what it would tell you about all the different things that um, it offers the community. You know, keeps our homes cooler, uh, water quality is improved, uh, wildlife need, you know, needs trees, of course, for a place to live and play. Good for the economy. Our homes are worth more money when um, trees, mature trees are on our property. Um, roots and soil and uh, the crown of the tree and, and leafage um, all help absorb stormwater run runoff. Um, there's been a lot of research that shows that trees, uh, good tree canopy cover, uh, actually keeps neighborhoods safer. People are calmer. They're, um, you know, trees have a, a psychological impact on us. And then, of course, the uh, climate change and air quality impacts that trees um, help with as well. So that's just a kind of a simple graphic that talks about the many environmental services. Just a word about our current tree cover. 46.6% um, of the county has tree cover. Okay, 60.3 is forested areas and it shows you the acreage, uh, 28.7 over turf grass, four, four uh, and some change over impervious surfaces, buildings along roads and my uh, graphic there kind of covers a little bit of that. And then 6.6% um, is other tree cover. So, but this sounds pretty high when you think about, you know, say, oh, wow, almost half the county has tree cover. Well, the truth is there are parts of the county where you see this figure here, 8%. It's really low. That is in the Montgomery Hills section of the county. And um, there's Long Branch has, uh, I think, 13%, very low uh, for these urbanized areas. And um, what's considered a healthy tree cover for an urban area is actually 25%. So you can see how 8 to 13% falls well below that. Um, just a word here, we've experienced a net loss of um, less than uh, or 4,546 uh, acres on developed land between 2013, 2018. And um, we are the second highest in all the counties in Maryland to lose canopy to uh, development. The first is PG County. All right, one estimate from Jim Urban, who's a landscape architect, is that about 80% of tree cover or canopy in Montgomery County is on private property. Private property being either businesses or, or home lots. So our answer to taking control of um, sustaining canopy was to come up with Home Tree Care 101. This is the program I mentioned earlier. It was developed as a way to show homeowners how they can take, how we can take action to preserve our own trees and keep them living longer with good care. So this, the, uh, these are just some shots from Home Tree Care 101. We send an arborist out to um, a community. These classes are held on request. Um, someone will step forward from a neighborhood, a leader, a community leader will step forward and say, hey, I'd like to have one of those in my neighborhood. And then we coordinate with that community leader. Um, the, that organizer brings the, the bodies there. You, you know, that person will send things out via their uh, neighborhood listserv, uh, next door, whatever they like to use to communicate with their neighbors. And then um, we all meet up on a given Saturday morning that's scheduled and an arborist, and these are, our, um, let's see, where's the, there's Jack right there, Jack Pond. And this is Andres um, Ovalle. Uh, these are two current arborists. And this is uh, one of the original arborists who worked with us in the program. Anyway, we bring the arborist to your community. And um, it's kind of a walkabout. We walk around the neighborhood. We stop at neighbors' houses. 
before the class, um, there is usually some discussion among neighbors about what their biggest concerns are. Someone might say, hey, I'd, I'd really love to have the arborist stop by my house and look at this tree. And the arborist will do an on-site evaluation <clears throat> of a tree that is of some concern. They'll also do hands-on pruning. They will talk about mulching, uh, proper mulching, and other ways to care for trees, like taking invasive uh, vines off the trees. An outgrowth of Home Tree Care 101 is a new manual that we, we just published this fall. Uh, it's Healthy Trees, Healthy Communities, A Guide to Tree Care in Montgomery County, Maryland. Uh, it is a book. It is um, online as a digital book. We have um, some limited print copies right now. There is a website, which is montgomerytreecare.org, which is designed um, to track with the book. And I am going to see if this will open up real quick here. There we go. So this is the digital. You have to put in a zip code because we're trying to keep a record of where folks are who are accessing the guide around the county. So this is flipping book. Opens so up. We, so we can't actually see that. Oops. Screen, uh, new share. Here we go. I'm sorry. There. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to turn the page back. There's the cover and flipping book. And just to kind of flip through a little bit, the book is in two two sections. One, the first section is how to care for your trees. And you can see all the topic headings somewhat there. Part two is why we take care of our trees. And it gives a little bit about the history of different tree laws and whatnot in the county. We have a glossary. We have additional resources listed. We have an extensive um, bibliography. Um, but that's essentially how how to access the flipping book version of it. You can see we've got diagrams, um, a lot of things at, uh, explained in, in detail in the guide. Okay, so I'm gonna go back over to the PowerPoint presentation and here we go. And you can see my screen here again, right? Okay, <clears throat> so the guide was put together it's an outgrowth. It was, it's based on, really based on what's covered in Home Tree Care 101 classes. Um, what we find is that uh, homeowners really like to have something they can walk away with, like a reference point they can walk away with and, and refer back to. So um, we put this together. We used to do handouts with like a thousand pages and a packet. Um, it was really really more costly to put that together than than this guide. So this kind of simplifies things a little bit. I want to talk to you a little bit about our county tree tree planting programs. These programs are all covered in the guide in terms of what they do and how you can um, access these programs. Tree Montgomery is run um, out of the uh, Department of Environmental Protection. Laura Miller runs the program. Um, they started planting trees through Tree Montgomery in 2014. Uh, we have Tree Montgomery because of the 2013 urban canopy law that was passed by the council then and signed by Ike Leggett. Um, this goes into effect if, uh, say, a developer or even a homeowner who's remodeling, if they need to... Um, disturb, say, up to 5,000 square feet of space where trees are located on um, a lot, then um, that triggers the sediment control law. And um, that means that um, a developer or, or someone taking down trees uh, to develop a remodel um, must either replant or pay uh, into a fund. <coughs> and, excuse me. And the fund is specifically for replanting trees. And to date, Tree Montgomery has planted 11,000 trees, which is pretty darn good. Um, free trees, you go, you can Google Tree Montgomery and it pops up on the DEP site. Um, you make a request and they will come out and put, you know, more than one tree. You can get a, even a little stand of trees planted on your home property for free. 
And then Reforest Montgomery is, um, that is a result of fees paid into um, the fund for the forest conservation law. The forest conservation law covers tracts of land over that 5,000 uh, square feet of space, larger tracts of land. Um, there is an ag reserve component of it called Relief the Reserve. But again, this is another one for free trees. So uh, very often, if someone applies for trees through Tree Montgomery, uh, either one of these, through Reforest or Tree Montgomery, and one program doesn't accept the application for whatever reason, then you can apply to the other program and very likely you will get your trees planted. Um, a lot of people do not know about the ability to get trees planted adjacent to your property through the um, Montgomery County Department of Transportation tree planting program. And you would make a request through 311 or go to the DOT site and make a request through there uh, to have uh, trees planted in the right, right of way near your property. Um, just moving right along. This gets into, again, you know, what you can do. Uh, the list, plant trees. We were just talking about the free tree planting programs in the county. Um, you can use deer protection to keep them uh, healthy and, and away from uh, the deer population. You can prune older trees and keep them healthy by uh, good pruning and cabling large limbs and multiple trunks. You can remove invasive species. I'm going to talk a little bit more in some of the backup slides about uh, invasive vines that choke out trees. Um, talk to your civic association, talk to your homeowners association about launching a neighborhood invasive removal day. You can um, you know, have a, a volunteer effort where you go house to house and you and your neighbors help um, take uh, vines like this uh, English ivy off of trees. And uh, if you go to the tree care guide that we just published, it tells you how to remove vines from trees without damaging the tree. All right, make use of the tree planting programs, which I mentioned just a, a minute ago. And you can have your HOA or Civic Association sponsor a Home Tree Care 101 class. And that would be a matter of contacting Conservation Montgomery to request a class. Um, another thing, uh, your HOA, and I, I'll talk about this a little bit more in, a, in another slide, your HOA or, or Civic Association can offer to remove stumps in the right of way. You have to have a permit, <laughs> excuse me, a permit to do uh, any work on any tree or stump in the right of way, and uh, you would contact DOT about that. DOT is getting more and more requests from homeowners associations to say, hey, we'd really like to get some more trees in the right of way, but there are these stumps. And so you can partner with DOT to get the stumps removed, and then they will come out and replant new trees. And then, of course, most of you know, stay engaged locally um, with the state and with the county government and write to them to let them know that you want better tree laws. So about invasives, most of us have seen, I don't even think Peggy's got some really good pictures to add to this, but uh, this poor tree is in big trouble. And uh, these vines should have been cut off a long time ago, but it's never too late uh, until the tree is dead. Um, but these vines are going to just eventually choke out. They're going to choke out sunlight. They're going to choke out uh, water, you know, rain, rainfall that the tree needs and uh, really deprive the tree of nutrients. So um, this is very important to take these off of trees. This is a uh, Japanese knotweed. This is another uh, invasive that you might find growing in your garden or around trees. You want to keep that away from these are some resources. There is a Maryland Extension Service. You can go online and um, look. I, I personally, I think they have got the best guide for identifying invasive um, species that you want to keep away from your trees. Um, their guide is really good because you've got pictures and descriptions of all the different um, invasive plants. Weed warriors, I'm going to talk about that a little more. You can volunteer to... Uh, work with Weed Warriors. It is a Montgomery Parks program. It was started by Carol Bergman many years ago. 
Carol Bergman is a forest ecologist, and uh, she is one of our uh, main sources of information. She's one of our technical experts that we um, we talk to all the time from Conservation Montgomery. Um, weed warriors, you can volunteer and learn a lot just by volunteering on even one of the Weed Warriors projects. And uh, you get to Weed Warriors through the Montgomery Parks website. Francis Ligo Creek does wonderful work along with um, also Rock Creek Conservancy in terms of um, invasive removal in those watersheds. Um, there is a Maryland Invasive Species Council that you can look up online. <laughs> Excuse me. And Carol Bergman is a member, of course, of that council. All right, so uh, this is us, how to contact us, how to access our website. Um, you can email us if you would like to get a print copy of the guide mailed to you. And I've got some backup slides I wanted to go through. Um, many of you may li live in some of these areas. This is an urban tree canopy analysis um, unfortunately, it has not been updated uh, recently. It was done in uh, 2011 by the University of Vermont for um, the planning department. And I, I suspect there might be little change in some of these areas. I mentioned Montgomery Hills earlier with a low percentage of 8%. Um, flower branch, uh, honey branch, Arliss Center, long branch, there's your 13%. So you can see <laughs> mainly, you know, you'll get up to Clarksburg, you know, you've got not so much development up there. It's uh, getting to be more and more, but they're, they have a little higher percentage of canopy, northern parts of the county, North Bethesda, you can see things are diminishing there. Olney Town Center, Shady Grove, um, this just gives you some ideas. Uh, CBD in Silver Spring, 14%. Again, not real good when you consider we need 25% for a uh, healthy, sustainable uh, community. Okay, about stumps. Um, I mentioned DOT is being approached more and more um, about stumps in the right-of-way. And uh, the person to contact would be Brett Linkletter. Uh, and Mike Knapp from DPS, because you have to have a permit uh, to remove a stump. Um, you couldn't remove it yourself. You couldn't hire a, a private contractor and just go out and do it. You would want to um, get approval from these two county departments before you started working on something like that. And they are very willing to work with residents who would like to do this. Um, the reason is, there is a huge backlog, and I don't have the numbers right in front of me right now, but there is a big backlog of stumps in the right-of-way. Um, DOT has a lot of trouble keeping up with that. We're losing trees. Then you get your stumps. Where you have stumps, you can't replant. So um, they welcome support from uh, community groups and, um, and, and working in collaboration with community groups. So... Once a stump has been removed, DOT will plant a right-of-way tree from their recommended tree list, which you can find online on their uh, street tree maintenance website. Left to right, these are just some species that you want to look at. Uh, we've got left to right Japanese barberry, English ivy, the most common. You can see that just really going to town on that tree. Uh, Japanese honeysuckle. It smells wonderful. The vines are pretty, but you don't want it on your trees. Um, calorie pear, Japanese knotwood. And um, these, again, these are from the Maryland Extension Service. Really, really good um, visuals that they provide. Okay, here's a little advice from Carol Bergman in terms of invasive species. Um, Carol gave me this this afternoon. She was in kind of a hurry running out to meet some friends for dinner. Um, she said, <clears throat> try to plant and landscape with native species of trees and shrubs on your property always. Important for many reasons, they will survive. Uh, they have evolved over uh, time with the local fauna and with our local conditions that are going to be uh, the most environmental benefit. So plant native um, and don't knowingly plant non-native invasive species. Um, they can outcompete natives very quickly and get out of hand very quickly. 
And uh, the reason they succeed is because of their ability to grow in these environments. So, um, and you will all get a copy of these slides, of course, and this is being recorded. Uh, a little more from Carol. If you have non-natives, try to manage and remove them. Uh, she talks about what we just uh, we just mentioned, which is they can girdle the trees over top and block the sun. Um, several types can kill trees entirely and and very quickly, like kudzu, uh, especially wisteria. <coughs> Excuse me, wisteria is another one. Very pretty, but you don't want it growing on or around your trees. And then again, we're talking about Japanese honeysuckle and so forth. And then Carol, uh, of course, advised to get involved with a local effort to remo remove invasives. So weed warriors run by the parks and planning. There are other weed warrior uh, groups who have been trained by uh, parks and planning. And uh, those are the groups that are working now with, say, Rock Creek Conservancy and Friends of Sligo Creek. So, um, you know, even like I said, going out on one of their um, projects will will give you a lot of good information and you can organize something in your neighborhood to remove invasives. And that is um, that's it for the slides. So I am going to go back and find you guys. All right. Okay. Um, questions or comments? Uh, Peggy. Yes. Um, foreign invasive vines as opposed to, to native vines. Is there some reason to distinguish between them? Because if a vine is going to kill a tree, why do you make a distinction between non-natives and natives? Uh, that's a good question. And uh, this, the answer is, if you've got uh, a vine working its way up one of your favorite trees, whether it's native or non-native, you want to take it off. Right? Right. So, yeah, so we're, we're equal opportunity on that in terms of natives or non-natives. If it's going to climb up your tree and choke your tree, you want to take it off. <laughs> Excuse me. Tickle on my throat tonight. Anybody else? Questions or comments? Oh, follow up. I understand the Parks Department uh, Weed Warrior Program trains people to distinguish between native vines and non-native vines so that the native vines can be kept there. But that involves, I would think, quite a bit of training to distinguish between the two types. Mm -hmm. and, and once again, if a native vine is going to kill a tree, why would you leave it there? That uh, That is something that I'm gonna talk to uh, Carol Bergman about and get a little more information and send you guys a, a response, okay? Thank you. Yeah, okay. We've got a couple of questions here. Uh, Dan, why don't you go first, then Joan? Um, I have a lot of evergreens on my property that are recently suffering from what I've been told, spider mites. Mm -hmm. Do you know how to get rid of that? And then I have some property up in Pennsylvania, and the neighbors are telling me that the, the uh, 24 acres that we have there, the trees are being infested with spotted lantern flies. Spotted lantern flies. Yeah, so uh, I, I noticed you dwelled on invasive plant species. species right. But, uh, what about the uh, invasive insects? Do you have some suggestions on how to deal with that? Yes, um, I've been told if you see spotted spotted lantern flies, just just kill them, <laughs> kill them as soon as you see them. Um, and my advice would be to go to the Maryland Extension Service and um, check in with them about invasive insects. Elizabeth. Yes, Dan, I know about spider mites. They destroyed one of our trees. What you do, it's pretty simple. You get a hose and you put it on high power. And first, first what you can do is spray the, the, the nests. You can see the spider mite nests. They look like spider webs, but they're different, but they're on your evergreens. Spray them with neem oil wait a few minutes and they get a high powered hose and knock them off and that will take care of them. 
uh, but you just have to keep watching for them and you can get rid of them. Thank you. So, so much information with this group. Uh, Joan, you had a question, please. You are muted. Go, Joan. You have to unmute. Joan, you're muted. You're muted. She figured it out. Sorry. Um, I, I thought I saw the, the little thing change. Um, my concern is about the developers. Um, I, you know, I, I realized that in my neighborhood, a lot of tree loss is due to simply age because the, the original development was enough time ago that the trees have, have begun dying. But um, what's happening in our neighborhood is a lot of teardowns and replacement with bigger houses. And I had fantasized that there would be laws such as you describe that um, if trees were going to be taken down that the developer either would have to, you know, well, I don't think replacing is good enough, um, that they would have to pay into a fund. And so I'm glad to hear that's true, but I do wanna comment that um, replacing a, a, a mature tree is obviously not, uh, not the same you can't replace a mature tree with even multiple small trees because every tree is worth hundreds of trees or after enough years. So I think I would I would like there to be stronger laws to protect large trees. And I don't know if you can comment on that and what we might do. I see that Amanda Farber from our board joined. Um, and Amanda, I'll just ask you if you if you might want to address that or are you, are you um, in transit or able? Sure, yes, yeah, sorry. I, I literally just got off the bus from New York City, but I wanted to um, be part of this meeting. So I'm listening in. Um, uh, and by the way, I was visiting some of the uh, American Elms that they have up there in Central Park. And it's absolutely gorgeous nice. time nice. of year. But um, this is a very timely um, question because um, a group of us have been, have been focused on this issue. And <clears throat> Karen referred to um, the tree canopy law and the roadside tree protection law. But I want to really just you know, think about the well, well, we can talk about both of them, but <clears throat> those laws were put on the books approximately 10 years ago in this county. And a lot has changed in those 10 years, right? And so a group of us has started to focus on, well, we've had 10 years of seeing what works and what doesn't work and what changes have been happening. We know that there continues to be tree loss. So what can be done to strengthen those laws? Now, um, with the tree canopy law, which is focused on private property and when there is a sediment control permit, so there's land disturbance, whether that land disturbance involves taking down trees or not, it doesn't matter. The taking down of trees is not part of the equation. The equation is based purely on the amount of land disturbance. So let's say we're gonna use the example of 5,000 square feet. There's 5,000 square feet of land disturbance. The property owner or developer uh, is required to either pay into the fund or replant three trees, whether or not there were trees on the property or not. It's, it's a very sort of a straightforward calculation. It was done that way on purpose. And Karen can talk about the history. Um, I wasn't directly part of it at the time, but I know it was like blood, sweat, and tears went into making that law even to even have that law on the books where there would be some mitigation required. And at the time they said, okay, again, using this example of 5,000 square feet, you can either pay into the fund at $250 a tree that's owed. So in that case, three trees, or, or you can plant or some combination. Um, and this is talking about shade trees. Well, fast forward 10 years later, and that's the same amount that was required for the roadside tree protection law, by the way. So that $250, 
fast forward 10 years, trees do not cost $250, right? And so um, several of us have been really pushing on this issue because it's really should be sort of low hanging fruit, straightforward math um, that the cost should be what the cost is. And I am happy to report that um, after about two years of bugging county officials, um, last week, um, Andrew Friedson and Evan Glass co-sponsored a bill to raise the fee to, <clears throat> to increase it to the actual cost for both of the laws. So for the tree canopy law, that would be about $470 for the roadside tree protection law, it would be 200, uh, sorry, $450. And so, so significant increases from what is required today. And um, it was introduced and then I nearly fell off my chair, but every single council member who was present said they wanted to co-sponsor. Uh, so the only one who wasn't present that day was Jawando. Um, so, it looks like there is a good amount of support for that. There's gonna be a public hearing November 28th. Folks are definitely welcome to write in testimony supporting this. Um, now, here's what I wanna sort of just emphasize. This is, this is a small, straightforward, but important and impactful change to the law. There's, yeah. there's other things for sure that can and should be done to strengthen these laws, but we want to get this passed first because uh, experience has taught us if you start going off in all different directions and all different asks, then um, things get more, take a lot longer, it gets more difficult and there's no guarantee. So um, because this is currently introduced and it seems to have momentum and support, uh, we want to get this done. And then um, as a part of Conservation Montgomery, I am part of a group that formed when we had the forest conservation amendments passed earlier this year, which was about two years of work to get those done. And we we're, we call ourselves the MoCo Forest Coalition. That group is happy to have um, more support, more input, more ideas for what to tackle going forward. There's a lot of ideas floating around of other ways that those laws can be strengthened. We really wanted to see this fee issue um, taken care of um, because again, it just is, it, it makes sense to do it. Um, but there have been ideas about, you know, should there be um, again, this is a fee, it's not a fine. So different jurisdictions have it set up differently. So going forward, does it make sense to look at uh, the size of tree in certain circumstances and, and add additional requirements to that? Um, does it make sense to uh, increase the budget for stump grinding? Because wherever there's a stump, <laughs> There could be a tree, or or near, you know, at least in a lot of places. So we have a lot of ideas of what we'd like to tackle next, and we would welcome um, support from anybody who's interested in this area. And hopefully that um, helped answer your question. And you're welcome to put my. I can give you my contact info too if you want. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Um, I see a, I see a couple of questions in the chat. And I, I see Paul's hand up. Paul, you had a question about stump removal with a five-year backlog. Uh, what can be, um, how can that be fixed? And um, apparently that um, that section of street tree maintenance is historically underfunded. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's a real struggle. And so you can write to your county council members, um, you know, especially around budget time, right? And make sure that they know that stump removal is very important. We cannot get those trees in the ground if the stumps are still there. So please, you know, exert as much um, political pressure as you can to ask for uh, more funding. And I mentioned earlier, you know, DOT is uh, open to collaboration with community groups. Um, on that. And there's another question from Jackie 
Um, if tree, if their tree canopy laws had at Montgomery Hills reach only 8% coverage in Long Branch 13. And the answer to that is that um, the laws came into effect after um, we had that assessment and after we knew. And that's one of the reasons we uh, got the 2013 laws in place is because of the data that had come in about um, you know, urban canopy coverage. So, um, you know, we got the data and then the laws came after that. Now, um, I will tell you guys that uh, I was, um, I, I organized the trees, we called it the Trees Matter Coalition back in 2012, 2013. I sat in <clears throat> meetings with developers, with others uh, in the community for months on end. And it was, it was it was the one of the hardest fights that I've ever ever participated in in my life. It was exhausting. Developers wanted no part of strengthening um, the laws. They they did everything they could possibly do to water down those laws, and they did it in some cases with the help of some then county council members. So um, we got what we got, and um, I'm, I'm not, I've never been satisfied with the two laws that we got because the urban canopy law basically still says, sure, cut those trees down. As long as you pay money into this fund, we'll replant trees somewhere else in the county. Um, it's basically, it, it put a tree planting fund in place, but it didn't do anything to protect existing trees. Now, the, the street tree law, the, the roadside tree protection law, does go farther than the urban canopy law. That does have um, uh, protection plans built into it. If somebody, if a developer uh, is looking at taking down a tree in, in the right of way to get his project, his or her project in, um, then, you know, they absolutely have to, uh, if there are trees in the right of way and, and, and they can stay in place, they have to put protective measures in place. Um, so there is a protection element built into that that is not in the urban canopy law. So, you know, we have to keep trying, we have to keep pushing for better laws. And that's where we need all of you to speak up and make your thoughts known to county council members. County executives on board with it, uh, frankly. Mark is completely on board with it. And he remembers the fight back in 2012, 2013 very well. So um, any other Karen, questions? Karen, can I just add one thing that's important sure. with this sure. meeting is that, um, is that it also includes a provision to increase um, going forward based on um, inflation. And so we won't have to go through this painful exercise again in five years or 10 years or, you know, it'll, it will happen automatically like everything else does in the county. Um, and that will just, be, that's a big improvement. Right. right. So um, if there are no other questions. I, I, I have my hand up. I pre-submitted questions. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, if you could just give me the courtesy of, uh, let me ask. So first, to comment on your stumps. I wrote to Elrich last year, and I wrote to Al Bornez, who was the county council president, and just got a plethora of excuses for why they couldn't do anything about stumps. And I did it well before anybody took any position on the county council. Is there somebody that really cares other than lip service? as far as the stump removal, which is five years back long. So they, I know that they, because this has been a high priority of our neighborhood in East Silver Spring, and I know they've been increasing the amount of money for stump removal every year, but it doesn't come anywhere close to meeting the need and the backlog that you, uh, that you reference. So we've been living with this backlog for um, the last the last five years, but they do increase the money. Um, we I had suggested that they create, and I think Peggy would uh, support this idea that they create a core of uh, of young people whose jobs would be to remove stumps. There's enough stumps and enough money surrounding this program that they could probably make it a going concern because they're not. They're not doing, they're cutting down trees, not removing the stumps, and we can't replace them in our part of the county where 
as Karen pointed out, has got uh, a low tree canopy. So according to what I got from Brent Linkletter, there was no appreciable increase in the stump removal money. So I'm not sure where you got your information, but again, I, I wrote to people, I talked to Brent Linkletter, and, uh, but let me get to my real question that I really want to get to Karen. That, that, that's been a long pet peeve of ours now for five, at least five years, getting the stump removals uh, done so we can replant trees. Brent Linkletter says he's got plenty of money to plant trees. He just, he needs somebody else to get the stumps out to put the trees in. And that's not the pretty part of the tree planting process. And nobody seems to want to put money on the table to fix that problem. The, the other question that I wanted to ask you that I, I pre-submitted, and I, I guess you, that didn't get to you. I, so I, I, actually, I, did. I did see to, that. I meant to address that. Yeah. Four to six acres of treed area, forest, natural area, that's been, the HOA wants to keep as natural. The problem is the ash borer probably took 20 or 30 of those 200 trees out. Uh, every uh, every ash tree there is dead and laying on the ground somewhere in the forest. The trees continue to fall down because of old age. There doesn't appear to be any trees growing in that area to replace the trees that are dying. And the question is, why is that? One probably is the deer eat the trees. The other thing we worry about is the Japanese stilt grass has completely taken over the base of the forest. It's about two feet high. We wonder if anything that actually would drop from the tree, acorn or whatever seeds, actually even makes it to the dirt to be able to grow a new tree. Uh, I talked to Brent Linkletter. He said, oh, there are people that plant trees, but uh, we have not been able to find anybody that will help us with our decaying forest. So from a county perspective of how many trees you have, and you talk about tree canopy, you can go in our tree area, and it's probably decreasing the number of trees by 10% each year, and they're not coming back. What can we do or what can be done to reverse it? We certainly don't have enough money to go in there and, and rebuild the forest. Yeah, and you're talking about this is private property? It's private, yeah, it belongs to the, it was bequeathed to the HO. It was, it was open space mandated by the county when okay. the HOA was built that, you know, you got to have some space, but it's used to have pathways through there that people could walk their pets and, you know, hear the birds sing and, and so forth. But now there's trees everywhere and the, the still grass covers up a lot of them. It's actually dangerous to walk through there. And uh, unless you're, you can hop over trees and uh, get up when you trip over something. Yeah, do you know what watershed uh, the property's located in? Well, we're in Olney, just, uh, east of, just west of Georgia Avenue. I was, I was thinking, um, you know, maybe one of the watershed groups might work with your community to do some clearing over there. Um, you know, depending on where it's located and what watershed it might be in. Um, so, so again, if you've got any references for me or any contacts, yes, uh, Brett yeah. gave me one and they said, Unless we had a grant, they'd be happy to help us if we had a grant. Right. But unless right. you can find somebody to give you a grant, there's nothing we can do for you. Right. Um, Paul, let me look into this and see if I can find some resources for, for your community. Because um, that would be great. I, I imagine we're not the only ones in the same predicament. Yeah. Yeah. And if there's a way we can intervene earlier rather than later, I think it would probably be best for, for the whole county. Okay, let me uh, let me look into it, and um, I will get information back to you through Alan. Okay, well, I, yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you for your interest and for your passion. One quick question here. Mm -hmm. uh, were you saying that any stump removal has to be done like by some kind of permit or something like that, or? Because... In, in the right of way, just in, in the right of way. Okay. Okay. Because I, I have one in my backyard where the the top of it's dead. I about ten years ago I I, I said at some point I'm going to take this tree out. So I've got two growing on either side of it. But at some point. Yeah. Gonna... Yeah. So. And stump removal, of course, depending on the size of the stump, it's not an easy easy situation. You've got to have it 
professionally ground and uh you know there are other ways you can try to go at it but it you know those involve putting chemicals onto the stump to try to get everything to decay and um i mean if it's if it's done right you know um it, it involves a professional I'll probably just let it decay itself away <laughs> when anybody yeah. takes this down. But even yeah. after 10 years, these trees are growing very nicely, but they've got a long way to go to catch up with. Uh, <laughs> right, right. Place. Yeah. Karen, there's a couple more questions. David Heller is uh, asked in the chat, what is your view of neighborhood volunteers planting seedlings one to two years old rather than large saplings typical of tree Montgomery and street tree programs? Some areas get a lot of volunteer native trees that could be transplanted while very small. Do you have an opinion or a thought I, about that? I, I say the more the merrier, um, you know, as long as you're you're putting something in, a sapling, whatever size, and you can uh, offer some, some protection for the young plant uh, when you get it in. And volunteer efforts are wonderful. Um, Conservation Montgomery used to plant trees as a volunteer effort, and um, we just did not actually have the capacity to keep doing that. And once Tree Montgomery um, came into uh, existence, we we said let's let's let the county do it. They've got the money and the and the manpower. Peggy Dennis. Uh, yes, just to add on, deer were brought up. Any sapling which grows will be eaten by deer. So every young tree, if you want it to survive, is going to have to be given that protection. A Thanks, Pe yeah. Thanks, Peggy. Uh, Joan, did you want to follow up? I know that you were indicating that you had uh, a comment. Are you still there? Do you want to make that comment? I, I put a couple of comments into the chat. Yeah, um, I see that. Yeah, uh, just to, to get those ideas out there. Um, mm -hmm. And so, because I, I, the cost doesn't begin to get the attention of the developers. Right. Um, yeah. Well, for them, for them, it's always cheaper to just clear cut. Than, yep. It's, so, it's stunning the, 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 the trees I've seen go down. Right. Um, and I I don't know what it would take to get them to it it, it would I don't know it, it, I don't think we can stop them fast enough. Yeah. We've already lost so much. Um, and, but and, a other, bit, and a business expense, right? So they can yeah write yeah, write it's, it off. It's, right. And, and right. It's stunning the 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 cost of the houses that they're throwing up. It's just you know they. Um, and actually, a related problem to the size of the houses um, is it's not just that they go up, they're also going down. And we've had a couple of houses in our neighborhood where they hit groundwater. So they they were digging deep basements, and we're we're just like a the cup we're right up against Rock Creek Park here in Kensington Estates, and when they've struck groundwater. Um, you see water running continuously. They actually have to put the water, they get special permits to then put the water directly into the storm sewers. Um, and my fear is that it could actually affect the water table and that will affect the trees in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. At which uh, the thought of draining the water table just makes me sick. So I don't know if anybody, I, I've just been trying to bring this idea up to a lot of folks because I would like to uh, know if hydrologists could ad address that. And maybe uh, one of the things we'd have to advocate for would be a moratorium on low basements that you, you may have to limit the depth that uh, builders can go down. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm not... Really? That's a good point, John. I want to follow. You've got your second question here was about bamboo, and we don't talk about that often enough. I think what bamboo is definitely an invasive plant. Mm -hmm. right? And Joan said that uh, they were using the bamboo in Rock Creek Park to feed the pandas. Right. And I did not know that they were. I talked to some of their personnel when they were harvesting bamboo near our, our houses. And um, I had no idea that 
the zoo was using that, I thought that these were all, and they may be, escaped plants from people, from homeowners in the area. But um, you know bamboo spreads and it's a mm -hmm. nightmare to get rid of. And if, if they no longer have the pandas, I would really like to see somebody, the weed warriors or anybody address the bamboo. Yeah, Rock Creek Conservancy is a good resource there, Joan. And they do have their own um, weed warriors program. And that is a really timely question for them now that the, the pandas have uh, uh, gone away. One of the interesting ideas came up over the last uh, year and a half is from our friend, Diane Cameron. And uh, she was uh, thinking about ways to to ratchet up um, the harvesting of bamboo and then using the bamboo as uh, shields around young sapling trees that you would be able to uh, make some sort of protective uh, case with the bamboo. So I thought that was a very interesting idea. I don't know if anybody's made any uh, prog progress with that. Um, do we have any, any more questions for Karen before she she leaves us? And then I know that Peggy wants to uh, talk off uh, talk about uh, a proposal that she's uh, considering proposing to the Civic Fed. Any more questions for Karen Matson? Uh, we've got two subject matter experts on this call, Amanda Farber and Karen Matson, who were instrumental in putting together the Tree Guide, which is now available online and available. There it is. It's a it's a it's a incredibly valuable resource. Um, it's online in the Flipping Book. There's a website that corresponds to it, and you can get copies. Uh, it's a project between Conservation Montgomery and DP. And uh, we've been uh, very lucky to uh, to have them work on it. Um, I, I think that I, I encourage all of you to 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 look at it or get a get a copy of it. And I also encourage all of you to take matters into your own hands. Take a look at those trees on your property. Take a look at your home lots and see what you've got there and see if there are any concerns. There is a whole section in the guide that talks about um, tree concerns and diseases and you know things that you can flag. If you can flag it soon enough, you can save your tree. But uh, you know, really take hold of that and um, protect your part of the county tree canopy in your, in your own yard. And I'll say this before Karen uh, logs off. Uh, tree canopy and tree care are two of the uh, most important issues for neighborhoods. And it's a perfect way to engage uh, your neighbors and engage the community. Yeah. And the Civic Fed over the last several years, we've been focusing on community engagement around pedestrian safety, around public safety, and about the environment of which uh, growing trees and protecting the trees we have is really is really important uh, factor. Uh, you can go to the Conservation Montgomery website, conservationmontgomery.org, and learn more about the Home Tree Care 101 uh, program. Uh, Karen described it at the beginning of her remarks. Uh, we facilitate a trained arborist coming to your neighborhood, walking around to the places that you want to go, making uh, making recommendations about how to uh, uh, take care of the trees and some shrubs. Our arborists are incredibly engaging and very knowledgeable. And so I commend that to all of your attention. ConservationMontgomery.org and then look home a home tree care 101. Karen? Yeah. If you take one of the classes, the arborists are fantastic. They explain things in layman's terms. And honestly, they will stay and answer questions as long as you have questions. They will stay there all day. They love it. They love having um, a captive audience of people who love trees as much as they do. So I encourage you to take a class and enjoy the interaction with our our arborists. So thank you all. Thank you all. I'm so glad to see you on here. And uh, I will follow up with some of the questions and get, get some information to Alan for you. And we will send it out to uh, all of our members 
the uh, links to the flipping book to the website and we'll send uh, Brett some information on how to get a hard copy of the book aside from printing it, which is yes. one of his questions. So thank you so much, Karen Matson, for yeah. what you do for all of us. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. I'll start right in. Uh, Alan, were you able to get any of those photos from my presentation that didn't make it into the newsletter up to use as slides? Well, I, I sent them to you and I will, uh, of course I sent them to you so you could review them and I will. Uh, They're photos. Uh, Don't worry uh, about reviewing. Just put them up, please. All right. Well, let's see. Issues. One is finding arbitration reform for state and higher education employees. Who was that? Who was that? Um, can you see my screen? I don't uh, know who it was, but let's move on. No, easy, easy. All right, so I'm going to share, and I'm going to go to the invasive trees. Can I see that? I see my pictures over on the left. Okay, so we're working on we're working it. So let me just find slideshow. Here we go. Well, this you're is... working it. I, I will say how I started getting interested in the problem of the killer tree vines. My son signed up as a volunteer with Chesapeake Climate Action Network to help remove vines in the trees in Tacoma Parks parks. And that involved a fairly extensive training program and having to work with groups. He thinks he think that they did a lot of good in terms of getting the vines out of the trees and away from the trees, but his objections to the program were that they started at 7.30 in the morning during the winter when it was cold and almost dark outside and nobody wanted to be out there and you had to work in groups. Uh, I scratched my head and started noticing as I drove around for instance, here's a picture of Route 355 in Clarksburg. I think these are mostly English ivy going up the trees. English ivy, I guess, must be an evergreen because it's there day in and day out, no matter what the uh, what the season is. Can you move on to the next one, Alan? This is right along River Road. It's an entire hillside swamped with vines, which are starting to go from the, the uh, cut hillside up into the trees. Next. This is right along my bit of Falls Road. I should say I'm a volunteer with the Adopt a Road program. We pick up litter along the road signs, roadsides, and it's a very good program, but I think saving our trees is even more important than picking up bottles, cans, and bits of plastic. And as I pointed out in this tree, rescue service is too late to save these trees. Once they've been swallowed up, strangled and completely smothered, they're not gonna survive long. And then we'll have even more trees that have to ultimately be cut down and more stumps to be removed. So we really wanna save the trees before they get killed. Next, please. Here's another place. This is along the Clara Barton Parkway. You can see the English ivy going right up the trees. Hasn't gotten into the tree tops yet, but the trees are definitely threatened. Next, another falls road. This is a clump that I walk past when I'm picking up litter. And you can't even tell if the trees are alive underneath all the vines. Any more? Oh yeah, they're right in Rockville, center of the city. English ivy going up middle lane trees. Just incredible amount of damage being done there. At any rate, if, if that's the last one, Alan. Uh, it is. I will go ahead and say that I began thinking that this is a problem way beyond just a few youthful volunteers. We really need to have hundreds of volunteers going all over the county, cutting these vines out. And along the public right of way is the place where we can all see the vines doing their damage, worry about the vines. And when I'm out picking litter, I look at the vines and say, now why can't I just get in there with my pruning clippers and cut the vines down? 
But according to Brett Linkletter, I can't do that. Why can't I do that? Well, there are liability issues. Excuse me, I'm in just as much danger, if not more so, when I'm walking along the side of the street and picking up litter. If I were 10 feet off the street cutting vines out of trees, I'd be a lot safer. So I'm not sure what the liability issues are, but of course, volunteers can always sign a form waiving liability for any injury they might sustain while doing volunteer work. I, I think in order to get a lot of volunteers, and I did in the thing that was printed in the newsletter, include a list of about 20 different uh, organizations, starting with the uh, Audubon Naturalist Sierra Club, Conservation Montgomery, Maryland League of Conservation Voters, Chesapeake Bay Foundation. There are so many groups that could be tapped to encourage their members to become volunteers in a program like this. But I think a program like this has to be made far easier than Tacoma Parks program in terms of people learning how to do what they need to do. I think a, a uh, video program showing how to kill the vines safely and effectively could be something that people could watch in their own homes on their own time parameters and go back and look at again without having to join a group for more formal training. Uh, my suggestions on training were that the priority sheet should be on safety first for the volunteers. It should cover guidelines for working only in the public right of way. And this becomes a problem where there's no clear distinction between the edge of the public right of way and people's lots. But that I think is something that can be overcome with DOD's help. There should be tips for eradicating, I think, all vines going up the trees. Killer trees, killer vines are killer vines, whether they're native or invasives that have come from somewhere else. And if you have to train volunteers to distinguish between the two types of vines, you're probably going to get far few people willing to come out there and do the work. There should also be tips on a training video on what to do if somebody comes out and challenge you or says, what the heck are you doing to our trees and our vines? You should be able to provide them with a piece of paper saying, I am a DOT tree hugger. I'm out here cutting the vines so they will not keep, kill the trees. Uh, it's possible that training materials could be borrowed and edited from programs already in place, like the Parks Department Tree Warriors Program, or yeah, Weed Warriors Program. Uh, volunteers should also in addition to signing a hold harmless wa waiver, wear simple orange plastic safety vests. These are the ones that you just put on over your other clothes that could identify them as a DOT tree hu hugger or a DOT tree saver. They could provide their own tools and equipment. They should carry a letter from DOT certifying them as a tree saver, savior, or tree warrior and spelling out what they can and cannot do and possibly carry a letter, copies for distribution from the county asking homeowners to eradicate vines on their own trees. This would be pertinent for trees which are right along the edge of the public right of way where the volunteers probably should not go in and touch the trees because they don't know if the tree is on private property or in the public right of way. And lastly, I'd like to take photos, the volunteers should take photos of the trees that they have liberated and saved and provide data on the number of hours worked and trees saved. Um, uh, Brett Linkletter, I think, is very reluctant to even think about this because I know he is already understaffed. He doesn't have the staff to go out and fight killer tree vines. And I don't think he has the staff to even get a volunteer program up and running. So I would like the Civic Federation to consider, and I'll put this into the next newsletter, championing a program like this and asking the county government to provide additional funding to get a volunteer program going. Questions, comments? 
Well, thank you, Peggy. It's a great idea. And I think we all know the importance of saving the trees. Um, I suspect we're going to have the same problem with a program like this that we have with the stumps, that yeah. there's uh, that there's that there's no money. Um, well, maybe, we, maybe we put the uh, the two programs together, the uh, greatly upgrade the, uh, the price of taking down a tree um, as part of redevelopment and use that to fund the rest of this. And then you kill 15 or 20 birds with one stone or so save Peg 15 or 20 trees with one uh, bill or something. <laughs> so Peggy will put a proposal in the next newsletter. And we'll discuss it uh, then. I see Chris Reynolds is still on the line and his Civic Association, Seven Oaks Evanswood, has done some um, really remarkable work on invasive vines. Chris, can you join us and tell us uh, how you've organized that? Uh, hey, I'm outside. I'm not sure you can see me at all. But uh, yeah, so we invited out uh, 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 one of the Weed Warrior Specialists um, through our Environment Committee um, and have had them volunteer a couple of Saturday mornings for several hours. Uh, and groups of volunteers from a neighborhood get together and learn, you know, there's too much to learn about all the different kinds of weeds and all the different kinds of invasives, but just to learn about vines specifically and noting the, you know, six, seven or eight most common time types of vines. It's not that hard to learn, you know, just that number and pick out the good from the bad. Um, and once you're, you're trained on how to identify and how to remove them, uh, everybody should feel empowered to, on their own property, on neighbors who are fine with it, just go ahead and, and do it. I mean, there's there's more concerns, of course, about park property and property you don't own and things like that. But uh, just every, every bit you can do for the, for the trees that you can reach legally and safely um, helps keep these trees alive for oh, just a little bit longer. But we've been really impressed with the, uh, the willingness to volunteer and come out and train that the weed warriors have, have shown. So Seven Oaks Evanswood is lucky that they have an environment committee, and that the environment committee is so engaged. It's a good, uh, it's a good model, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, discuss it in more detail and share some ideas for the rest of the members. Thank you, Chris, Jerry Garson. I see your hand is up. Is it about this issue? I know you're going to give us a treasure yeah, report. Yeah, it's about this issue. Uh, can can Peggy put a thing together for one of our newsletters or uh, yeah. uh, on how yeah. to do it, or can you put something on our website so it would explain how we should be doing this? And the second part of my question is, I regularly, uh, ever since COVID, have done quantity of walking on uh, in Cabin John Regional Park, and there are a large number of vines, especially in the the area enter from Goya uh, uh, Road. And is there anything that can be done to get rid of the vines in Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission properties that are killing trees? Well, of course, they have the Weed Warrior program that's under their uh, their authority. There's just not enough money for all the trees that are um, damaged or threatened by these in, invasives. Um, I, every year we we've requested more money to go to parks for uh, stump removal and for uh, tree planting and for the invasive uh, plant removal. And uh, it's, you know, well, one of the other things that we have to, we have to remember is that climate change is making it uh, easier for these plants to grow. So we have a difficult situation. It's gonna be hard to sort of get in front of it, but uh, Peggy's gonna be putting some information uh, yes, and on the I, web on the website, and we're also going to be sending out a a special note to our member associations because we'd like to, them to share it with their uh, members. Peggy, yeah, uh, Jerry, you weren't here, but Karen's uh, Tree Care One Hundred and One has a section on vines in the trees, so that should be very good to look at. And I suspect the biggest problem with the Parks Department's Weed Warrior program and vine cutting program is that they simply do not have enough volunteers to cover all of our Stream Valley parks. Little neighborhood and community parks are relatively easy to take care of. Our Stream Valley parks don't fall under anybody's care and protection program. And if there aren't enough volunteers to go up and down the Stream Valley valleys and cut the vines, the stream valley trees will die too. 
I'm sorry to hear that. I, I heard, I just joined on video the later part of the thing, but I was listening in the car on the, uh, the on my phone. So I heard some more of the stuff. Um, thank you, Jerry. It's good to see you. Welcome to the meeting. Um, any more questions on trees and invasives uh, before we uh, get a treasure report, um, talk about some committee issues, and then uh, say good night for the evening? Any more questions about trees, stumps, and invasives? You raise your raise your hand. Um, they're doing some good work in some of our member associations. Woodmore Pine Press has got a really active environment committee, as uh, does uh, Seven Oaks Evanswood. So uh, those are really models to uh, be emulating. I'm going to see more questions about trees and uh, stumps. So let's ask our treasurer for a treasurer's report. We'll then quickly talk about, uh, we'll just go through the list of committees, and then we'll adjourn for the evening. Um, Jerry, hold on for a second, please. I'm going to uh, end the video.